going to um, hook our wagon to the Sunday morning sermon. Remember we talked about Elijah and how that while others waited, Elijah was committed to serving the Lord. And he went up there and he, he built that altar and he said those prayers and the fire came down from heaven and consumed all of it and nobody had to wonder at that very moment. Everybody knew, like the people said, they all fell on their face and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Meaning Baal is not God, okay? So that's a good point right there. The devil is not God, okay? He wants to be, he's always wanted to be, he still wants to be, he's still got plans to be. He wanted to be in heaven for the creation of heaven and earth. He wanted to be God when Jesus went to the cross for crucifixion. It's absolutely fascinating. I'll tell you about it sometime. He still wants to be today, and he will still want to be in Revelation. Uh, I'm not so sure that when the Bible says then there was there was war in heaven, Michael the archangel fought against the devil. I'm not so sure that that is a last-ditch frontal assault that happened in the end times. It's not just talking about way back then. But that really has nothing to do with our lesson tonight, except this. Baal is not God, but God is. And you and I are servants of the Most High God, right? Now you think then, if we're going to serve the Lord, if we're going to be like sold out and committed to Jesus, that we got no problems, no worries from now, right? That we're going to be superheroes for God just all the time. But we're going to hook on to our story here about uh, uh, Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18. And if you look at 1 Kings 18, verse number 39, you'll see where our, our, uh, our account ended from Sunday. Uh, all the people saw it. They fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Now we're going to read real quick the rest of Elijah's day. Elijah, this day, he is, he is like God Jr. He is a superstar. He's got superpowers. And it is amazing what he does this particular day from the yeah, remember it began early in the morning making the sacrifices and all those things and getting ready for it all right now look at if, if you're in first kings chapter 18 then look at verse 40 and elijah said to them seize the prophets of baal do not let one of them escape so they seized them and elijah brought them down to the brook kishon and executed them there he oversaw the execution of all 850 false prophets and then elijah said to king ahab Go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. And why is that significant? Because it had not rained. It had not rained three and a half years, not a drop. And uh, God had told Elijah, go tell the king that. Okay? It is done. You're going to have three and a half years of, of drought. And so now Elijah comes along and says, okay, here comes the rain. 41. And Elijah said to Ahab, uh, here, oh, we already read that. 42. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. There he bowed down on the ground, put his face between his knees, and said to his servant, Go up now and look to the east. So he went up and looked and said, There's nothing. And seven times he said, Go again. And it came to pass on the seventh time. Seven is the number four. Perfection and completion. That's right. The seventh time he said, There's a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. Okay. So he said, Go up and say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Now, we'll, we'll just talk about this as we go along. Here's the thing. Ahab uh, loved his horses. If you remember after three and a half years of drought, he was not looking for water for his people. He wasn't looking for food for his people. He was looking for water and for food for his horses. Because he told Obadiah or whatever his name was, he said, maybe we can find something to keep my horses alive. He loved his horses. So here's the king in the king's chariot with the king's finest chariot horses. And Elijah said, okay, here comes the rain. You better scamper on home because it's 20, it's 20 miles from here to Jezreel where you need to be. And, and God's about to make up for all this lost rain that we've not had. And there's coming a flood. You get ready. Because Elijah, again, as the Bible says in the book of James, he prayed again. So what's he doing with his head between his knees? He's up there praying to God, just like he did for fire. Now he's praying for water. All right? He's a superhero, I'm telling you. Okay? So uh, Ahab rode away to Jezreel. Verse 46. 
Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Now get this picture. Here's Ahab. He sees the storm and the wind blowing, and the royal horses are flying across the desert, 20 miles as fast as a royal chicken. He looks at his rear view, and what does he see? He sees Elijah. And Elijah outruns the chariots 20 miles. He could have beat any Olympic marathon runner on that day. Because he outrun, okay? Elijah had a really good day. A really good day. He was on top of everything. Now, here's the thing it hadn't rained in three and a half years. Ahab and, Je and Jezebel had had a reign of evil and wicked and the most vile and hideous bunch of folk that you can imagine for years and years and years. All the other people of God, so Elijah thought he had been gathered up and executed. Jezebel found him, she'd kill him. It took a long, long time and a lot of waiting and a lot of praying. And all that time, God did nothing. Or so it seemed to him. And then Abraham, not Abraham, keep calling him Abraham, it's not he's Elijah. And then Elijah had his day. He had his day of the Lord. And he prayed fire from heaven and he slaughtered 850 false prophets and he prayed up a storm, literally, and he outran a chariot for 20 miles. And from time to time, I keep running across this, and it goes like this. The longer it takes to get prayers answered, the greater the answer to those prayers when it finally does come. How, how long were the Israelites in uh, the Egyptian bondage? How many centuries? 400, 700, I forget. How many? Four? 430. And then God called Moses and said, I've heard their cries by reason of the taskmasters. So they prayed for 430 years. And how great was their deliverance? The nation of Israel prayed for a uh, Messiah for how long? Thousands. From, from Abraham on down to the days of Jesus? Yeah. The longer it took to get an answer, but how great was the Messiah? King of kings and Lord of lords. We've been praying for the Lord's return for 2,000 years. He hadn't even opened the door and peeped out and said, I'll be there. Right. long it takes to get an answer. How great will it be when he does come back? So here's Elijah. He's been, he's been working and praying for three and a half years and longer. Got nothing. And then in a day, God did more in a day than anybody could do in a 1,000 years. You see how that works? Not only does God really, really, really answer our prayers exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, it says in Ephesians, but also He just He just shows up and, and He can do more in just a few minutes. How long does it take Him to save your soul when you ask, when you ask a prayer? It, instantaneously, wasn't it? Yeah. And has it turned out to be even better than you expected? So it's, just, it's that way. But sometimes we can get discouraged because, you know, again, here's what we think ought to happen. The more I, the more I pray, the better things get a little bit of time, a little bit of time. And sometimes that's the way it works. But sometimes that's not the way it works. Have you noticed that? That you pray, you pray, you pray, and it's like nothing. You pray for someone to get closer to God and they get closer to the devil. You, you pray for some, some blessing and some... Something, something good to happen and some tragedy happens and said, you think, well, you know, God, are you even listening? We would never tell him that, but we think it to ourselves. God, are you even listening? Do you even care? And God says, remind, to remind us, we're not looking for uh, a salvation of soul. We're not looking for an incremental improvement. I, I don't want a lost soul to get a little bit less lost day by day. I'm looking for the day when it's like the Bible said about the uh, prodigal son that he had his head in a slot bucket. He was as far away from his dead as he could get. Okay, his head in a slot bucket. And the Bible says, he came to himself and said, what am I doing here? I'm going home. 
And it took Daddy a while to get that prayer answered, but when it did, I mean, that son turned around and everything changed. Well, you and I are the same way, because you, can you think back to, 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 to high and great and glorious days, short periods of time where God was just doing wonderful things? And can you look back and say there's long periods when it looked like nothing, it looked like the drought was on, right? Well, we have to be patient. The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, okay? They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run when it's time and not get weary, and they will walk when it's a long, long, plodding road, and they will not faint. Okay? All right. Now then, Elijah has had the day of his life. David's career, David's ministry, the day of everything. Now, you would think then, you would think that from now on, he is... He is a holy superman on earth, right? Now we're going to start again in chapter 19, verse number 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how, also how he executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger, an email, I guess, to Elijah and said, So let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this day. So what was the devil's response after the killing of his 850 false prophets? I'm going to get you. Okay? I'm going to get you. So, you know, you don't, you really, we don't expect the devil to say, oh my goodness, you, you're such a, a holy person, I better just slink off and leave you alone. He's too proud and arrogant for that. So you have to be prepared. Okay? If you're going to pick a fight with the devil, you better be prepared. And it doesn't mean you have to be afraid of it, but you better be prepared because what does the New Testament say about him? He walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Okay? So there's going to be a roar. Now, also, he's a liar, and he may not have any fangs or claws left either, but he's going to make you think he is. So here comes, here comes, here comes a spear. And uh, verse number three, when Elijah saw that, he arose and ran for his life, and went to Beersheba, which, by the way, is 80 miles away. Boy, this dude got out of town, didn't he? Driven by what? Faith or fear? Driven by his fear. And after all he'd been through on this one day, now he gets one threat from one woman who had just lost all uh, 850 of her workers. Okay, but the queen bee said, I don't, I'll, I'll see you dead by this time tomorrow. And he, and he just melted. And he trembled, and he ran for his life like a scared bunny rabbit. And he didn't stop, and he didn't stop, and he didn't stop. He went 80 miles away, and there he left his servant. And then he went 20 more miles out in the middle of the, of the wilderness, so could nobody find him but him and God. He was absolutely terrified. Now you look at Elijah, and you say, what, what, is, what is wrong with you? Did you? Just yesterday, did you not call down fire from heaven? It, just yesterday, did you not oversee the execution of all the enemies of God? Yep. Just yesterday, did you pray a storm after three and a half years straight? Yes. And just yesterday, did you not personally outrun the fastest chariot on earth? Yep, I did. Then why in the world are you trembling in fear and running for your life? Now here's the answer. You ready for this? Because he had prayed down fire and prayed down a storm and seen him and killed a bunch of guys and outran a chariot. He was absolutely exhausted. Now we think, you know, I get we, we're going to do the Lord's work and it's going to be great and it's going to be wonderful and it is. And we forget though that, it's, that we are still humans. We are still frail. We're still very, very limited. And it doesn't matter how much of the power of God we might have while we're doing our work. When that's work, when that's over and it's done, we're tired. Amen. If you don't believe it, try to get a lucid thought from the preacher at one o'clock on Sunday. I used to bounce back when I was of a uh, a different uh, decade, perhaps in my life. 
for over the last few years, here's how it is. I do my thing on Sunday morning. And, and, you know, we're going to come in the spirit and get the message, take care of business, absolutely. Go get a bottle of lunch and then puddle for the rest of the day. It really takes it out. Well, does that mean that it wasn't the real deal? If I did it in the strength of the Lord, am I, not, I, should, I shouldn't even be tired, right? It doesn't work that way. We're still human beings. And God will allow us to do what we need to do, but then he knows we need to rest. That's why one day in seven is called a day of rest. That's what a Sabbath means. That's why he filled their calendar in the Old Testament with holidays where he said, no work must be done on this day. Let's have the Lord. Go and prop your feet up. Stay there. So even Jesus would, would go away with his 12. He'd be working, working, and, and ministering to the crowds. And then he'd say, guys, come on, let's go. And they're thinking, we still have people here. And Jesus would say, it's time for us to go. Not only for his benefit, but for the guys that he ran with, for everybody else's. So I want you to see what what happens what happens here next. Elijah has run off out there, and he's he's just he's just wiped out. Okay. Verse four. He himself went a day's journey in the wilderness, came sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. And he said, "It is enough now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's." And he lay down and slept under the broom tree. Here's what happens. We even even if you're even if you're doing the work of the Lord, even if you're doing the right thing, even if you have a uh, say a job, a career that you know is a blessing from God, from God and it's part of your calling, and you put in your eight hours and your twelve hours or whatever it might be, even if you're off on a mission trip, even if you're dealing with these precious children at home. And you know it's it's the blessings of God, and He's giving you strength to chase after toddlers, or at least giving your wife strength to chase after toddlers. I never did have that strength, and all these things. Yet it still it wears on you, and it wears you out. It wears on you physically, and then it pulls all the energy out of you mentally, and then it pulls all the energy out of you emotionally. Then it pulls all the energy out of you spiritually. This is what, this is what exhaustion is in the life of the day in which we live. Now we have seen a whole lot of that over the last year or two, haven't we? Haven't we? The stress and the worry and the concern and everybody's world turned upside down and, 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 and here comes the fear. Fear gets a hold of us. People can't sleep. They can't work. They can't eat. They're they're terrified. And uh, alcoholism goes up. Suicide goes up. People uh, despair of hope. When your when your body's exhausted, y'all you know you're y'all know you're a skin bag full of chemicals, right? When your body gets exhausted, cortisol levels go up a bit. The, the adrenaline's pumping. 24 hours a day, okay? It's supposed to be a short-term burst to keep you from getting eaten by the roaring lion. But in our society, it's a con it's constant stress, constant screaming for our attention. Well, if, if, if someone yells, have we got a deal for you, part of my brain back there doesn't know that it's not the roaring of a lion. And, I'm, and we'll find ourselves on the edge. And now you can't sleep at night. And now you watch too much news. And now you you worry and you're fearful and you and you chew and you and you stress about all these things and you'll find yourself with your eyebrows knitted together and you're trying to be happy but half of your brain is still running horrifying scenarios about what if this happens and what if that's happening and did you hear what I heard and uh, you know what's happening over there and what so what so and so said and we live in a constant state of stress and we get completely exhausted first physically. And then mentally, our brains, they just don't work like they used to. And our default brain system is to, is to watch for fear. Now, God says, I want you to watch for good things. Whatever thing is good and pure and wholesome and holy and virtuous and a good report, think on these things. And the reason he has to tell us that is because it doesn't come naturally. 
naturally, we think about danger and fear and how to protect ourselves from what that may happen so that we can continue to survive. That's what I believe. So we have to actively work on our optimistic mind. We have to, or else we won't have one. And the constant stress and all that's going on around us keeps pulling us down and pulling us down physically and then mentally and emotionally until, you know, we're, we're, uh, it doesn't take much to either uh, make someone mad or make someone crumble in tears. Because everybody's up in an emotional basket case. You know? And then it affects our spirit. You know, where did our prayer life go? Where did our Bible reading go? Where, uh, how much do we get out of church now? We will show up, but it's just, I don't know, I'm just supposed to go to church, I guess I'll go. You know? Well, now we've had to bump up the whole idea of masks again. That's, that's discouraging. I don't know about you, but that's discouraging to me. That's an attack to me. That's, my, that's the line roaring at me. You know? and, and, well, here we are a year and a half into it. Well, what's the use? What's the point? Let's, I'll go home and eat watermelon. Not a bad idea in about 30 minutes. But anyway, and we find ourselves exhausted in, in every level, right? Even God's children, even us, we are just wore out. And, and in my business, I tell you, I have talked to most of the people that I have counseled with, most people, you know what their main issue is? Exhausted. They're exhausted. They're, they don't know how tired they are. People, especially, especially caregivers. I don't know if you notice this, but I'll tell you how this works. When, when a person gets sick, gets down at home, and the other person takes on the role of a caregiver, now you'll find that both people, both of them, put all their resources into the sick person. And eventually what happens is that this person's life just absorbs the other person's life and strength. And, and, and the caregiver is in danger uh, of not making it sometimes as much as the original person who was sick. Because the person that's sick gets used to taking extra resource because they need it and they're just given gladly by the caregiver. Absolutely, I'll be sure I'm fed, I'll be sure I do this, I'm gonna take my medicines, and I, I'm gonna get my rest, and yes, I'm gonna hydrate, yes, I'm gonna go to the doctor and do all these things. And the other person, the caregiver, is running and running and running, can't sleep at night because you got one eye open and one ear open listen for the person in the other room. You forget to take your pills because you're worried about them. You have to go do this, you have to go do that, but at the same time, in the back of your mind, you're thinking about the other person. And it just sucks so much of your energy out of you. And we become exhausted. And so I, I, have, to, I have to tell caregivers, your job is to, is to rest. You have no idea how exhausted you are. And I can tell by looking at y'all here this Wednesday afternoon, a lot of you, you don't know how exhausted you really are. If you were banned to a desert island where there was nothing but food and water and nothing to do for a month, you came back, you'd be a completely different person. But who's got time for that, right? We don't have time for that. Well, we don't have, we don't have, we don't have four hours to string together unless that's what we call sleep. And I'll protect you again. Now, if I were God, I would catch up with old brother Elijah out here he can run all he wants to, but you know, when it comes to God, you can run, but you can't hide, right? And he knows right where he is under that, under that broom tree, passed out like a little scared uh, bunny rabbit. And if I was God, I'd show up and I'd give him a kick, and I'd say, boy, get up from that. What were you doing this time yesterday? Oh, I was out running chairs, and I was calling fire from heaven, and I was, by the grace of God, probably, absolutely. And you're going to let one old old woman make you so scared that all that crumbles you can run for your life. What's wrong with you? I'm ashamed of you. But I'm not God. Amen? Okay. And God understands. He understands these things. He knows how exhausted we are. So I want you to see what God did for this little boy. Now Elijah, he said, you might, you might as well kill me. Uh, because his frustration turned to, to desperation which just turned to depression and despair. He fell down under the tree and said, you know, dear God, do me a favor, just kill me. Take me on home, I'm done. I'm not any better than anybody else. I haven't done anything. I'm the only one left and trying to kill me. 
I'm just tired. I'm tired of the whole thing. Do me a favor and just take me on home. Have you ever been close to there? That's a bad place to be. And, but the God of grace and mercy shows up, sends an angel. Verse 5, then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. Not get up from there and quit feeling sorry for yourself. He said, Get up. I want to feed you. And then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank, and then what? He lay back down and went back to sleep. Are you kidding me? Did, uh, did, did God wake him up and say, Boy, let's go? He let, let him sleep. He let him sleep. Verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he rose and ate and drank. So he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Oreo, the mountain of God. Now here's what I like about God. God loves me. I really like that. God understands. God gets me. God knows my limitations more than I do. And God's all, he's always trying to tell me that there's a difference between what I can do and what he can do. Sometimes there's a difference between what I want and what he wants. Sometimes the difference is not in what I want he wants, but the time, the difference is in the timing. And God shows up with Elijah and he says, he, look, he looks at his, little, at his little son there and he's, you know, it's poor little Elijah. He is, he is just exhausted. And he's scared and he's wore out and he's depressed. And God says, you know what you need? You need to lay down and get some sleep. And after you've slept a while, I want to give you some proper nutrition. I want to give you some good hydration. Now here we are, 2021. And what do we know about being healthy? Rest, nutrition, hydration. We're not going to talk about exercise, but that's 40 miles worth. We don't talk about that. Okay? But, God, but listen, here, here's the point. God says, you are a disaster from one end to the other. We are going to begin healing you and strengthening you and getting you ready for the next phase of your journey because you've got to go back 40 miles now to Mount Horeb and you're going to go in the cave and we've got some, we've got some emotional issues to work out in the cave. Still small voice, right? We've got some spiritual issues to work out in the cave the wind and the fire and all that, and the earthquake and all the government. Okay, what are you doing here? He's going to have a, 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 a psychiatry session with God, and he's going to get to the root of his problems, and God's going to get him over the hump and send him on his next set of missions, which look completely different than what he was doing the other day. But that's another story for another time. But this is what I want you to see right here, is that when he was so exhausted, so wore out, God came along and said, here's what you need. You don't need a prayer meeting. You don't need to fast and read your Bible for 48 hours straight. You don't need a sermon. You don't need to tell somebody to tell you to straighten up. Because we can't, we're not going to be able to take care of that mental, emotional, and spiritual thing right now. But the, first of all, we got to take care of your physical thing. Because the way into your mind and your emotion is through your senses, through your physical body. Now, you God, you can talk in the heart. I understand that. But I love what God did for him here. He says, you know what? I, I'm not going to scold you. I'm not going to chastise you. You know, this stuff's talking, coming out of your mouth right now. It, it's going to be horrible. And by the way, when the chair comes down to pick you up, swing low to pick you up, won't you be glad on that day that God did not answer the prayer on this day when you said, I just want to die? Well, they never find you in this room tree. Your bones still be there. God knows what he's doing. He's patient, he's kind, he's gracious, mercy, merciful, and loving. And he says, okay, you're a basket case. Go to sleep. When you wake up, eat a good meal, get plenty of water, and then go back to sleep. And when you get up, get a good meal, drink plenty of water, okay? And when your brain is working, not your mind, but your brain is working, because your brain needs this physical, you know, what is it, Brother West? Three ounces? Yeah. I'm kidding. About three pounds. Three pounds. Three pounds of brain. 
if that's not working right, you, you know, you're not going to be faithful. So when you find yourself exhausted, when you find yourself weary, when you find yourself stressed out, do I want you to pray? Well, sure, I want you to pray. Pray without ceasing, what the Bible says. But I'll tell you what, you can do for yourself, and God don't mind. There are times in your life when you just need to check out. Have you ever felt like what you really want to do is go home, pull a cover up over your head and say, you know what, forget it. I'll see you tomorrow or not. You ever had that? I'm going to give you pastoral permission to pull the covers up over your head and kiss the world goodbye for a day. Because again, you don't know how exhausted you really are. Right? Right? Now, I know this by experience, not just by theology, okay? Me and Miss Evelyn, we've had a crazy month, and we are exhausted. And so just today, I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling, uh, being tired and being fearful and worried, concerned. Well, I've got to figure out what to do about this now, and all the stuff that's going on, and it's getting worse again, and I've got to tell everybody I've got to wear ma their mask again, and... That's going to make me the bad guy. So that's why I made Wes tell me it was okay. So he can be bad guys with me, okay? And he don't care. I mean, it's Wes. He don't mind. And we I appreciate it. I dig that about him, okay? But but you never know where it's going to crop up. It was a lot, you know. Last week we drove eight hours on Friday to the visitation and the family drama that I can't even tell you about. It was worse when we got there. And then... The next day, had that funeral and all the drama, and then drove another eight hours back. Got home about midnight, get a few hours of sleep, jump up and be ready to go for Sunday morning for two services. So I'm telling you, at one o'clock, and then we had uh, the visitors, and we, we took them to lunch and had a nice lunch, ate Chinese food, which was fine, okay? But once I got home, I'm like, Spoosh. and that's it. So, yeah, now poor Miss Ellen, she had to go to work the next day, but I did. You know, I may, I may still not be at work. I'm not sure. Okay, but you know, um, you have to, you have to take care. You have to take care of your, of your temple. Right? You have to take care of your body. You just do. You just do. You cannot be your best for anybody around you if you don't take care of yourself. You have got to get some rest. And I'm gonna tell you the last thing, and I'll shut up. I promise. You say, well, I lay down, but I can't sleep. I'll be, I'll be dozing off in the chair. As soon as I stretch out, my eyes pop open, and everything I start, it, here it comes again. And I just can't drink water. Ladies, I hate, I hate drinking water. They say, Terry, you come around with a little straw, and I, I just hate drinking water. And I, I really don't like vegetables. I like... Um, I like SAD, which stands for the Standard American Diet. I like a SAD diet. It is composed of salt, sugar, and fat. That's what Americans live on. I'm serious. I'm not making this up. That's what we live on. Do you really think that you can eat garbage for decades, not get any sleep, and be chronically dehydrated for decades? and be healthy. So you have to prioritize it and you have to know that it is a learnable skill. I have practiced and learned. It doesn't matter what's going on. As soon as I hit the pillow, I'm out like you blew out a candle. I have maybe one, maybe two sleepless nights a year. My problem's not going to sleep. My problem's staying awake because all the stuff that goes around me just exhausts me and I didn't go to sleep. Drinking water, I'm not, if people carry those, not me, man. I, I got a glass and I got my pitcher. I said, okay, when do I sit go? And I pour that glass and I guzzle it and I'm done for an hour or two. Just guzzle it. It's a learnable skill. It's just water is good for you. Good food, you have to look at those vegetables and that good quality meat and the seeds and the nuts and the fiber and all that. And you have to look at it and you have to convince your brain, this is absolutely delicious. And if you do that, if you'll do that a couple of months, you'll begin to believe it. And the next thing you know, you enjoy. It's like going to the gym. People go to the gym and they, they love it. What's wrong with them? It's a learnable skill in your mind. 
And do, do yourself and do everybody else around you a favor. Please take care of yourself. It is a stressful world. It's getting worse. By the time we think it's getting better, it's not. And you'll, 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 uh, you'll be a lot more spiritual if you're well rested and well fed and properly hydrated. Amen? That's a spiritual medicine right there. I want to leave you with that. All right, that's about his prepare. Lord God, we love you and we thank you again so much for the, the blessings of the day, all that you do for us, dear Lord. Thank you that you're kind and compassionate and loving and, and uh, sympathetic, Heavenly Father, and that you're always trying to look out for our very best interests, Lord. Now, Lord, we pray that you'll teach us uh, right from wrong, good from evil, and Lord, what to do and how to live our lives. We, sometimes we think we're so grown up, so adult, and the truth is that we're still just little kids. And we need so much attention, and we need so much care. And Lord, we're still trying to learn. So Lord, bless us and take good care of us. And teach us to take care of ourselves as well. Because Lord, you deserve the best of us. And we can't be our best if we let ourselves just fall apart, Lord. It's a stressful time, Lord. And it, it, it's hard to, to do what we need to, what we want to do and need to do for everybody around us and for ourselves as well. So Lord, we pray that you'll give us that wisdom and that reminder and that opportunity get our priorities right, which often includes, Lord, taking care of our physical bodies as well. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us, Lord. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' holy and mighty and precious name we pray. Everybody say it? Amen.